Before I get going, I'd like to take a minute to discuss a few things about this build. This is a hydraulic schematic of what I'm about to build. I'm going to be building the cylinder and the check valve, the needle valve I'm going to buy. Now, if you don't choose to build this, you can buy the cylinder and the needle valve check valve in one unit called a flow control valve on Amazon. This next drawing shows the three functions of the flow control valve. The drawing at the left shows the cylinder essentially at rest at, at the start. The rod is uh, attached to the base of the saw and the body of the cylinder is attached to the uh, upper carriage of the saw where the blade is. Uh, as you raise this, the carriage, oil is pulled out of the rod end of the saw, which I'm calling the reservoir, around through the check bypassing the needle valve into the uh, other side of the piston. The next drawing shows the hold position. When you release the saw, if the valve is closed, Oil cannot go through the needle valve, so it tries to go back through the check, and the check is forced on onto its seat, and it's held. If the valve had been cracked from your last usage, let's say, it would start drifting down at that same speed again. The last drawing shows the normal lower. You go from a hold position by cracking that variable orifice. You control which is the needle valve, you control how much oil is released back to the rod side reservoir of the cylinder. Uh, I'm sure that's about as clear as mud, but that's how it works. If you don't choose to build this cylinder like I'm going to show, then you can go on Amazon and here's a couple of part numbers for the cylinder and a flow control valve. Of course, you'll need fittings and clevises and tubing, uh, you're going to be looking at about a hundred dollars by the time it's all said and done. Uh, there are alternatives you can find, but basically this is an inch and a quarter bore cylinder, six inches of stroke, and a flow control valve which has the needle and the check valve in one, one body. The first lowering cylinder I put on my saw was made from a, a surplus air cylinder and a flow control valve and some spherical ball end uh, adapters for both ends of the cylinders. Now these are all surplus so I didn't have any money in them and they were pretty good except my big mis mistake is that I mounted the cylinder with the rod up and uh, shavings from the cuts, of the cutting of the saw uh, got between the rod and the seals in there and ate the seals out so it started leaking. That's why I decided to build my own. To start this project I had some inch and a half aluminum bar in stock uh, to make the cylinder rod head and the piston out of. I also had some uh, half inch drill rod for the cylinder rod, some uh, surplus spherical ball ends for the mounting, and uh, slug of steel for the base end of the cylinder. I had to order some uh, seamless tubing from Amazon and I had to pick up also some O-rings for the cylinder rod head and the piston and a couple of uh, small O-rings for the piston sill and wiper of the cylinder. The first thing to do was to cut the tube to length. I used a cutoff tool on the lathe to get a nice straight cut. The next step was to 
turn down enough aluminum shafting to cut a piston and the cylinder head out of. I had to trim it down to the OD of the tubing. I'm using a shop built a diamond tool bit and holder. The shearing action of this style of bit leaves a almost a mere finish on aluminum or steel. Part of the spar will then be turned down to the ID of the tube for both the piston and the cylinder.
with the cylinder mounted, I'll go through the operation of the valve. You raise the carriage up with the needle closed and it's held by the check. Uh, cracking the needle, you can control the lowering speed from extremely slow to as fast as the material can handle it. Uh, it's certainly an improvement over the old counterbalance spring. It's nice to have that variable control and be able to raise the saw and have it hold while you make adjustments. Here I am simulating cutting a piece of metal. You approach, you can approach this real fast with the valve, then pause it, line up your line, then start your cut. You can go as slow as you like, or whatever speed the material will handle. It's nice to have that control uh, and not be damaged your, your blade by too fast a feed. Finally, I'm actually going to cut some uh, metal. Here I show how I can uh, approach the work quickly, then slow it down. I don't like to ever cut too fast on metal. It just damages the teeth on your saw blade. So I'm running at the middle of pulley speed, and uh, it cuts it fast enough for me. I'm not going to do it really. And this is a 10-14 variable tooth blade uh, and it works really good on both uh, aluminum and steel. Uh, that's pretty, pretty evenly. It's not like the old counterbalance spring where you had to kind of, if it was cutting too fast, kind of lift the end of the carriage up so it wouldn't dig in too fast, jam the saw. When this gets through with the kite, you'll see that my uh, table for the upright position of the saw acts like a backstop, but excuse me, backstop uh, to catch these little pieces of heat from flying across the shot. Now that I have it working, I thought it might be fun to uh, tee in a pressure gauge and the valve so I could see what the operating pressures of the cylinders are when it's operating. Uh, I put a T in between the needle valve and the body of the valve. This will give me the pressure on the cylinder when it's operating. Here's another view of where the T goes for the pressure gauge between the body of the valve and the needle valve. This will show the load on the cylinder when it's in the hold position, as it's lowering, and when the blade is resting on the work, what kind of load is on the blade. Uh, it's just for fun, just to s s see what it looks like. Uh, and I had the gauge. It didn't cost me anything to do. This is the damage gauge I had. It's a fancy brass cased gauge, but it's got a cracked lens. It's liquid filled to keep the needle from bouncing, but it won't be used in this situation. Uh, 300 PSI is plenty. The saw never sees more than 200 unless you push down on the carriage hard. That's how it looks all plumbed up. Like I said, this is just for fun. I would never do this, but I had the gauge. It didn't cost me anything to do, and it should be kind of interesting to see what the readings are in the hold positions and with this, the saw running. Here's what the gauge pressures look like as the saw goes through its uh, range of motions from about a 45 uh, the highest pressure, of course, is when the cantilever is the greatest, when it's almost horizontal, gets up to about 200 PSI, and then when you release it, of course, it drops off to zero.
Now to see what the whole thing looks like going through an entire cut. Start off by uh, lowering your saw down from about 45 degrees to just before it starts into the metal. You can see the pressure is going up. But as soon as the blade touches the metal, you'll see the pressure dropping off because more of its weights being transferred onto the saw blade. I find it best when it's in the 50 to 100 psi gauge pressure for cutting in steel and uh, it cuts very smoothly at that pressure, at gauge pressure. Like I say, this is just for the fun of it. You're not going to really have much use of a gauge, but I had it, so I put it on, and it's actually kind of useful when I keep it within, like I say, the 50 to 100 psi range on the gauge. The saw seems to be cutting the best. It isn't getting forced into the metal, and it cuts at a pretty reasonable clip. This was a fun project to figure out and to build. It's very rewarding to have something turn out that works so well as this does, and it's one of the best modifications I've made to my saw. I hope you enjoyed the video, and I appreciate you taking the time to watch it. It's kind of a long video. Thanks. Bye.